If you like Quentin Tarantino, Guy Ritchie's 2000s movies, and Death Note, dude, this is a treat for you. Go read this book before the movie comes out. And if you want to take a break from your sci-fi and fantasy novels, because I know you do, I did. It's a completely perfect palate cleanser. And then, after reading it, you can go back to your we have time and Lord of the Rings and all that shit. This is of course going to be a spoiler free review and analysis of by Kataro Isaka, a 2010 Japanese dark comedy thriller. And boy does it thrill. Yeah, it does. Let's get the plot out of the way. The story follows three sets of characters which are on board the Shinkansen, Japanese for bullet train, and are traveling with their own missions for several targets and destinations, and the plot threads are going to coincide and entangle, and that's when the shit hits the train. All right, number one. The Prince and Kimura. Now, the prince seems like just an ordinary Japanese schoolboy. I guess that's why I got the Death Note wife. But he is a twisted psychopath. He likes to manipulate people, blackmails them, get them to even goddamn kill each other. You'll be surprised how much bloodshed this guy has gone. It kind of reminds you of Joffrey Baratheon, who was just cruel for the fun of it. And there is Kimura, who is on a revenge mission because somebody hurt his kid. You wanna guess who that somebody is? I mean, <laughs> I know. It's the f***ing prince. So that's how they are involved. Kimura gets on the train with the mission to, I don't know, hurt, kill this prince guy. And these two give you the first plot line of the book. It shows all those psychological layers that these characters have, peels them off, and I guess that's what you are here for. And again, don't worry, you are given this information like on the first couple of pages. Number two, Lemon and Tangerine. Yes, these are names of characters, which reminds me of another thing this book does amazingly since it's consisting of so many professional killers. They're referred to by their code names. For example, one guy is called Ladybug, another guy is known as Hornet, and these two are known as Lemon and Tangerine, and they're also known as the twins, but they, they're not actually twins. Now, these two are designed by the author to be foils to each other. If you do not know what foil is, I didn't know either. The foil is when a character is designed so that it complements and brings out the characteristics of another character that he's paired with. A very good example of this is going to be Captain Kirk and Spock. How Spock is a pure logical being and Captain Kirk is just good old lady killer. <laughs> These are, these two could not be more contrast with each other. For example, Lemon is kind of childish and takes things lightly and he doesn't care if the boss is gonna know or see, maybe they could end up dead, but he doesn't care. And he has a, this weird liking or kind of like a fetish to this British TV show for kids called Thomas and Friends. The show is also about trains, train engines, and he is constantly referring to other people as, well, you're like that engine, you're like that train. At the start, it was kind of annoying and I thought dude if this goes on throughout the whole book I'm gonna be so pissed but surprisingly it did go on for the rest of the book and it wasn't annoying. A couple of times I actually thought that was funny and Tangerine on the other hand is a guy who is like no bullshit serious guy I'm gonna do my job the boss gave me $300 to kill this man I'ma do it. Thanks before he takes every other step and that's how a professional should be. And Lemon is like, yeah, I guess I'm gonna drink some lemonade, you know, I mean. So every scene these two are in is going to be an absolute blast and I've caught myself laughing out loud a couple of times. The humor is pretty morbid, but it works. Number three, and now also known as Ladybug. I told you this book has a bunch of code names. And as you probably would have known, Ladybug is going to be portrayed by Brad Pitt, which is not what you will picture while reading the book. Okay, for this character, think of a ninja who is like extremely deadly, but like also extremely unfortunate. He is on board the Shinkansen to steal a MacGuffin. Things do not go as planned because yeah, the goddess of fortune is 
pissed off on him. So he has to improvise. It's so much fun to see him plan, execute those plans, getting into tight situations, getting out of them by quick thinking, using his environment. Holy shit, dude, he uses his environment. It's just so much fun to read. And now is my favorite character in the book. And of course, he has to deal with the pissed off goddess of fortune. Anyway, these are the main characters that you are invested with throughout the book. And there are a bunch of secondary characters too, which are supporting the above said parties in different ways. There are some unknown players that are after some MacGuffins and some of them want some assassinations done. In all this chaos and among all these shady characters, you do not know who to trust and neither do the characters. So all this ensues into a very thrilling ride on this train and you can't get enough of it. About the structure of the book, this book does some interesting thing about its chapters. Now, the narrative is obviously third person, but a chapter is named after the character that we follow in it. So suppose we are following the now. So every chapter that is focusing on the now is named the now. And on every chapter, there is this illustration of this train, which has all these different parts and cabins. And only the cabins in which the story of that chapter is going to occur is highlighted in dark. Now, this may sound to you as if the book is going to give you a spoiler that, oh, those group of characters are in cabin 5, and what if these are going to cabin 5, and you are told this even before you start the chapter just by looking at the illustration. Well, guess what? That's what the book wants you to do, to speculate, and once you reach there with the characters, you do not find what you thought you would. It's just even better. So once the juicy part starts in the book, which does start in the first 40 pages, this book does another brilliant thing that I've seen other books failing to do, and that is telling simultaneous events in different chapters or different parts of the book. It is done so flawlessly that it gives you that perfect Guy Ritchie editing flavor. Now what I like in stories like these are some good twists as it approaches its end. And this book gives you some amazing twists with some sweet reveals. Which reminds me, throughout the book, the characters are talking about these guys who seem like myths and legends, these assassins who kill their victims in really peculiar ways, who have built mafia kingdoms and demolished them. When some of these guys actually show up in the book, Dude, those are some great revelations. And it's like Nick Fury showing up at the end of a Marvel movie. For example, there is this Hornet, the killer, and you do not even know if this Hornet is a guy or a chick or even a kid or a teenager or even a group of people. When it is revealed, you're like, all right, holy shit, I did not expect that. The whole thing kind of becomes like this intricate puzzle that you have to solve. As I am making this video, I realized some things, especially about Nanao and Hornet. It was definitely something that you did not know that you wanted, but in a good way. Now, the end of the book, honestly, they could have done a better job. And if you kind of pay attention, you can see it coming. I didn't. It doesn't mean that I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, it exactly means that having said that, it's entirely possible that the book could have been totally up in the end. So I'm glad they didn't do that. And the last chapter that you see after the climax is a really sweet addition. It's like this epilogue at the end and it, it brings a smile to your face. And if I have to say another flaw, it's just me nitpicking. It has to be this all-knowing, omnipresent, third-person narrator because sometimes there are two characters talking to each other and all of a sudden the third-person narrator steps in and you're like, do, 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 shut up. Let me, let me listen to these two. It just kind of takes you out of the story a little bit at times, but that's just me. By the way, I just wonder that how much is lost in the translation. Now, this is a 2010 book, and it was translated into English just last year in 2021. Now, I don't know how different it is from the Japanese version, but hey, I enjoyed it. Ooh, another thing, did you know that this is not a standalone book? This is part of a trilogy and a number two at that, but it doesn't mean that you cannot enjoy this as a standalone story. I did and I 
I love it for that. By the way, if you want the audiobook version, that is great too. I tried some chapters. It's funny. If some of you guys read this in its original version in Japanese, do let me know what we are missing. I'll be totally thankful for any recommendations in the comment section. Do let me know what you thought of this book. Give us a thumbs up, help us out, and I'll meet you guys in the next video. Ciao.